All right. Um, good day, my class students. Today we would be continuing the discussion on gastrointestinal tract anatomy. But today we want to look at something that is a little bit different, which is the histology of the um, the tube, the alimentary canal. Or it's interesting to, to know that the anatomy, the histologic anatomy of the tube, which is the tube that extends from the mouth all the way down to the anus, the anal canal, have almost similar histological presentation. So we're going to look at a cross, a cross section of that now. So we start by bringing out an outline of the general human uh, gastrointestinal tract. So here we have um, an individual. All right, that's an individual. Okay, all right. All right, so that's um, the muscular guy. that's the tongue and that's the nasal cavity and the nasal pharynx the oropharynx the pharyngopharynx the laryngopharynx and that extends all the way down as the esophagus and this continues to go down as the esophagus here we have the Diaphragm, that's your diaphragm. Okay. And um, this extends all the way down, passing through the spadal hiatus, about 1.5 centimeter um, into the abdominal cavity. And then you have the stomach like that, the greater curvature of the stomach. Lesser curvature, the duodenum, and the whole of this area, you would have the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, and of course, that's the inner canal to the anus, that's the appendix on this right side, and this the ascending colon all the way down. Okay, so let's see if we would take a portion of cross section of this. So we're taking a cross section of the esophagus or any part, any part of the gastrointestinal tract, extending from the oral cavity down to the anal canal. We just want to take any part and examine that part. So we'd see that it has four basic layers of outline. Four basic outline. Um, they are number one is a mucosa. Number two is the submucosa. The submucosa. Number three is a muscularis propria. The muscularis propria. And number four is the adventitia. So we're gonna look at them, each one of them, just now, Adventist here. All right? Now, right there, we're gonna give you an outline, a drawing, a histological drawing of what that section is. So we start by um, the innermost portion, right? So the innermost portion, we give you this kind of appearance which is almost closed. So that's the lumen. So that's the lumen. And we know that the lumen is lined. So our lumen, the first thing we want to do is to see that our lumen is lined by a mucosa. That's the mucosa. Um, 
All right, so we will we, let's see what the mucursor. So the first thing, the first light layout is the mucursor. So the mucursor is divided up into um, three parts, which would be the epithelium. So the general layout of the gastrointestinal tract from the um, oral cavity down to the um, inner canal is that it is lined by um, an epithelium. So the epithelium in that area depends on what is going on in that area. For example, in the oral cavity, all right, in the oral cavity, because you put food in the mouth, sometimes very hot food, you need to chew. So the, the epithelium in the oral cavity and the esophagus is gonna be different from the epithelium in the stomach. And the epithelium in the stomach will be different from the epithelium in the large intestine and as well as in the small intestine. So the, these job descriptions that these part of the gastrointestinal tract system do, all right, is a function of the kind of epithelium that is covering that area so as to allow the um, that portion of the gastrointestinal tract system to withstand whatever difficulty is there so that they could take care of it. I'll give an example. In the esophagus, because you know, you gotta be swallowing stuff, sometimes hard stuff, hot stuff in the oral cavity, they're usually lined by a special kind of epithelium called uh, a stratified, non keratinizing squamous epithelium. So that is the kind of epithelium you find there. However, that changes as soon as it gets into the, um, the stomach. So in the stomach, you would have the secreting type of epithelium. So you have those goblet cells there. So they have columnar epithelium in that region because they all have to be furnished with goblet cells. See, there's a change there. And as soon as you get into the small intestine, it changes again. So it keeps changes. So the mucursor is comprised of number one, epithelia. Epithelia. Number two, it is comprised also, we're talking about the mucursor, of a supporting system called the lamina propria. So there is a supporting system called a lamina, a lamina propria. And number, number three is the muscularis. There is a, a muscularis mucursa as well. So there's a muscularis, muscularis mucursa. So let's see how we're going to represent that in this diagram. So the green is our epithelia. That's the green thing, all right? And the red portion is your lamina propria that is giving the whole thing its supporting, um, that supporting function. And then we have our muscularis. So this is gonna be our muscularis. That's your muscularis mucosa. So the muscularis mucosa will have smooth muscles in them that gives these lumen, because that's an opening, it gives the lumen its contraction, tonus contraction. All right, so the smooth muscles that gives it that tonus contraction. So we continue to expand our the cross section of our intestine. So we have this because it's going to be under the mucursor, so we call this the submucursor. So that's our submucursor. Between the lamina propria and the muscularis propria, we have some lymphoid tissues around here. So we call them lymphoid aggregates. So these are lymphoid aggregates for 
you know, that gives them this gastrointestinal tract lymph, uh, lymphatic uh, system for protection and all of that. So this is our submucosa. And then we have your circular muscle. So those are circular muscles. That's your circular muscles. So that's your submucosa. We have the submucosa. This is our the muscularis propria. The muscularis propria comprise of circular muscles. So these are circular muscles. This is a layer of circular muscles. And then we have a layer of we have another layer of longitudinal muscles. So these are layers of longitudinal muscles. These are layers of longitudinal muscles. All right. So these are layers of longitudinal muscles. All right. Finally, we have an outer covering. We have an outer covering. That's the outer covering. So the outer covering is the adventitia. So the adventitia is kind of tough and that is where you have your visceral peritoneum that is covering the, the, um, the structure. And now the visceral peritoneum will also convey with them blood vessels, major blood vessels, and also nerves that is driving into this system. Now we have to understand that this system itself is a complete system of its own. It is a system that can operate almost on its own. So it is described as the enteric, the enteric nervous system. So it has a nervous system that can operate almost entirely by its own because it is furnished with special plexuses that are existing at special areas or layers of this um, outline. And the first would be um, special plexuses that are found between the longitudinal layer muscularis longitudinal pattern and circular layer of muscularis propria. So those are those plexus, these plexus are called Albert plexus or myenteric plexus. So these are plexus called Albert or myenteric plexus. Albert or myenteric plexus. So remember where these plexus are found. These plexus are found between the longitudinal layer, between the longitudinal layer and the. See, I want you to understand this clearly. Between the longitudinal layer and the circular layer of the muscularis propria, so we have nerve plexus is called myenteric plexus or you can call them the Albert the Albert plexus we're going to discuss these in a short while the enteric nervous system now in the submucosal layer in the submucosal layer you also have these special nerve plexuses these special nerve plexuses all right these special nerve plexuses they're called the sub mucosal plexus or the mis nerve plexus so they're called the mis nerve plexuses or the sub mucosal plexus all right now within this submucosal 
layer, you could also find blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and um, other structures that are important to give this a complete um, functioning um, system itself. Now, something of point that you should know that contractions are initiated in the gastrointestinal tract system as a result of special pacemakers that are found from one layer to the next layer that are buried within the ganglion that, found, that, that forms these uh, Meissner and uh, myentary plexuses. These pacemaker, like the pacemaker that you have in the heart, I call the interstitial cells of Kajal. So the interstitial, inter, interstitial cells of Kajal. Make no mistake about it. The interstitial cells of Kajal, they are pacemakers that are found at each layer connecting the ganglion, the nerve plexuses that connect ganglion, they're found within those ganglion and they help in the initiation of contraction. Now nerve, nerve plexuses that are found here have nerve supply. They have nerve supply from vagus nerve. Vagus nerve brings in parasympathetic pre-synaptic fiber into the submucursor as well as the myentary nerve uh, plexus. They bring post, they bring pre-synaptic fibers. Remember that the anatomy of the arrangement of parasympathetic fiber are pre-synaptic fiber that extends from the spinal cord all the way to the organ that is to be innovated. Now, in the organ, the presynaptic parasympathetic fiber will synapse with the postsynaptic fiber in the organ. The postsynaptic fiber is usually very short, very small, and at the end, the terminal end of the postsynaptic fiber, acetylcholine is released and the release of acetylcholine will cause cholinergic um, function or excitatory function of the gastrointestinal tract system, which will cause contraction, increased parostaltic movement, the release of um, gastric juice, and all of them. However, the sympathetic fiber that is found within these um, uh, layers of enteric nervous system will cause inhibition of the um, parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so I want you to understand this basic anatomy, very basic anatomy and basic histology that is invo involved in this. This is a lumen, all right? Make no mistake about it. And the lumen is where you have the passage of bulk of food the lumen is um, the inside of the lumen, the wall of the lumen is lined by epithelium. Now this epithelium is part of what make up the mucosa. The mucosa is divided into three parts. The epithelium is one of it. The lamina propria is our supporting tissues. These are the lamina propria and of course the muscularis Mucosa is the smooth muscle that keeps this lumen in that contracted state and gives it its tone, the, the tone, the, the tonicity that it, it deserves. Now the other thing we need to talk about here is the types of that there are basically four types of mucosa in the gastrointestinal tract system. And these types of mucosa have been divided or classified according to their functions. And I'm going to take this again. The mucosa 
of the gastrointestinal tract can be classified into four types functionally in the gastrointestinal tract system. Number one is we have those mucosa whose function is protective in nature. So those mucosa that the function is protective. So we have the first type of mucosa according to the function now is protective. Number one, those types of mucosa whose function is protective in nature so we're talking about the epithelial lining of the gastrointestinal tract form system whose function is protective so you find them in certain areas not all of them not all the areas but you find them in the oral cavity you find them in the oral cavity you find them in the pharynx And then you also find them in the inner canal. So they are protective. So the type of mucosa or epithelium that is found in this area are stratified, non-keratinizing squamous epithelium. They are stratified, non-keratinizing um, squamous epithelium. In some other organisms you can have these mucosa keratinizing but in humans they are not keratinizing the other one in terms of the function of these mucosa is secretive now these mucosa secrete and this they're basically found in stomach they are found in the stomach So they are found in the stomach. So these mucosa have um, very long branch tubular glands that is found in the mucosa that are responsible for secretion of gastric juice. So they are long branching tubular glands that are found in the stomach. Their function is secretive in function. Number three, is absorptive. These mucosa are found in the entire small intestine. Remember that the small intestine is divided up into duodenum, jejunum, and the ileum. Now these type they absorb. It means that they are thrown into small finger-like projections called villi. So they are found in the small intestine, small intestine. They are found in the small intestine and they are thrown into small finger-like projections called villi. Now these villi, they have special pits or intervening gaps. These intervening gaps are called crests. These intervening grabs are called crypts. Now these crypts, these crypts in the duodenum, these crypts extend from the, these crypts extend from the muscularis mucosa. They extend, I'm talking about the duodenum now. They extend from the muscularis mucosa all the way down into the um, submucosa and these form special glands called the Brunner's gland. They form special gland called the Brunner's gland. Now the major histological difference between the um, the gastro the, the small intestine the 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 um, the the duodenum and the other two parts of the small intestine, which are the jejunum and the ileum, is the presence of Brunner's gland. 
the Bruce gland is found only in the duodenum. Okay? Now, sometimes you can have hyperplasia, hyperplasia of the Brunner's gland as a result of increased release of gastric content food, or food that has a lot of acid in it, into the duodenum, causing increased hyperplasia of this Brunner's gland. One of the condition, clinical condition in which you can have this is Zollinger, Ellison, Zollinger Ellison syndrome. Now, in Zollinger Ellison syndrome, you have a gastrin producing tumor in the stomach, a gastrin producing tumor that causes the release. It's a tumor that causes the release, increased release of gastric acid, and that will cause emptying of high content of acidic food chime into the duodenum and that will irritate the duodenum and cause increased proliferation of the bronze gland and that can cause um, obliteration of the ampulla or veta right there and affect the release of pancreatic juice and if pancreatic juice is not released on the duodenum and also the release of bile through the common bile duct would definitely have other conditions as well, clinical conditions. So at this point, I'd want you guys to go through this again and again, following the footsteps, how I have presented this, okay? Understanding the basic histology and the layers at which you find these um, these um, um, plexuses that forms the enteric nervous system. The vagus nerve is a major nerve that supply the gastrointestinal tract system, increased outflow of the parasympathetic nerve system will cause increased contraction, increased uh, secretion of gastric con gastric gastric uh, pit and also um, increase in the in motion so understanding this basic histology is important for you when you deal with um, pharmacology of the gastrointestinal tract system and also um, medicine of the gastrointestinal tract system and um, at this point I think I have been able to deal justly with this and I will see you in the next class. Thank you.